My name's Claire Dearden. I'm a consultant haematologist at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London and my particular focus of interest is the mature B and T cell leukaemias, notably CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukaemia. Venetoclax obviously has just received a license just at the end of last year, so it's the newest of the drugs that we have now to use to treat CLL. So in the session we've just had, we've been exploring uh, why we might use venetoclax, which p particular patients it would be suitable for, and how we would um, administer venetoclax. And I was focusing on the who and the how um, aspect of that. So in terms of who, uh, the license is clear that these are patients who, whether they have a, a TP53 abnormality or not, um, should have already received some prior therapy. Um, for those without P53 abnormalities, they should have received chemoimmunotherapy and a B-cell receptor inhibitor. And for those with a TP53 mutation or deletion, they should have uh, received at least a, a B-cell receptor inhibitor or be unsuitable for that treatment. So we were focusing on some of the data which has emerged in the last six months, uh, some of it presented at ASH and some of it now published, uh, showing what happens to patients who do uh, need another therapy after ibrutinib or idilalacib. Um, and we see that those patients who come off these drugs because they don't tolerate them have a much better outcome than those patients who come off these drugs because their disease has progressed. Um, if the disease progresses on these, on these drugs, so they've become refractory to them if you like, uh, their median survival is only in the order of three to six months. Um, uh, those patients who get a Richter's transformation have an even more dismal outcome with uh, survival of less than three months. Um, so the patients that are particularly falling into the category of needing venetoclax are those who, who progress or become intolerant of uh, the B-cell receptor inhibitor that they're receiving. And a few groups now have looked at the sequencing of the drugs and how well patients might do on venetoclax. And we see that actually the response rates are very high. So a patient who's failed ibrutinib or idilalacib can go on to get a 70 to 80 percent response rate with venetoclax with some good complete responses and even some MRD negative remissions and can have probably a long outcome, although we don't have long follow up on that yet. Um, the drug itself is very well tolerated, but has a significant risk of inducing tumor lysis. Um, the, the CLL cell is one which, in which normal cell death is being blocked by the overexpression of BCL2. And the cell is otherwise primed to die, uh, but that process is being blocked. If you take away that block by inhibiting BCL2, which is what venetoclax does, then these cells will die very rapidly. And that's what we see when patients receive venetoclax, is that they have immediate and rapid responses uh, with reduction of disease in all sites, so whether it's in the lymph nodes or the blood or the bone marrow. And that rapid reduction, which means that the white count can go from very high to normal within just a few weeks, uh, means that there is a significant risk of what we call tumor lysis syndrome, which is the release of a lot of chemicals into the body because of the um, uh, death of, uh, of large numbers of cells. So the, the introduction of the treatment has to be managed very, very carefully indeed um, by firstly assessing the patient for their risk of tumor lysis, and that will depend on their bulk of their disease. Um, and uh, we then would uh, ensure that they're on something which reduces the uric acid level, um, that they're very well hydrated, uh, and that the dose of the drug as it's introduced is done very gradually. So it's done over a five week period. They start on a tiny dose, just 20 milligrams, when the full dose is 400 milligrams. And that's scaled up, ramped up week by week in a very slow and steady fashion. The rationale for that is that the disease is being debulked, if you like, um, in a slower way to try and mitigate the TLS risk. Uh, and during that dose escalation, some patients, if they're high risk, will need hospital admission, perhaps. Um, they certainly will need monitoring of their bloods for evidence of tumor lysis, which is often first seen by a rise in the phosphate level, for example. And, um, and that you need to know that you've got all the backup resources to, to manage a patient if they actually do develop a clinical 
uh, tumor lysis syndrome. Um, what's been seen is that since these safety measures, if you like, have been introduced, the early quite worrying signal um, that this was a, a, a safety issue, there were a couple of patient deaths in the first studies that were undertaken, have largely disappeared and that now there are, have been no, in the more recent studies, there have been no um, incidents of clinical tumor lysis, only a very small 3% incidence of of laboratory tumor lysis. So it, is, it has been effective, but it's still something, a drug which is very powerful and therefore needs, it's a powerful weapon that needs to be handled very carefully.